So welcome everybody to the Malachi Center and thanks for coming to our first event of the year. Um, on Friday, the lady who climbed Everest and uh, about her training and how to ensure your success. Today we have Howard, who is so amazing. <laughs> yeah, I didn't climb Everest though. No, he's now, no. now I've got this superiority <laughs> complex. So I met Howard Siga at a Rainforest event. And if you don't know what Rainforest is, Rainforest is an organization in Edmonton where you can go and you can network with like-minded entrepreneurial and minded people. The thing about na uh, networking with Rainforest is when you go to one of their events, you have to go with the mindset of I'm not going for what's in it for me, I'm going with how can I help somebody? What can I give first? And that's what true networking really is. Help somebody first, and then good things will come from that. And I met Howard there, and uh, it's been great, because he connected me with some people. He also connected me with somebody who butchers really awesome meat, and I bought half a pig, and it was delicious, and now I'm gonna buy some cattle. But um, for you vegans and vegetarians and porridge, <laughs> I love meat. Um, <laughs> Howard is going to talk to us about his entrepreneurial journey today, and then he'll be available starting next week, every two weeks, for one-on-one -on -one appointments. You need to pre-book those with me. We get to a Wednesday, and he's got nothing booked for the next day. I'm going to let him know so he doesn't come in. So pre-book any of the one-on-one appointments you want with Howard. So I don't want to waste his time, um, and because I value his friendship and his involvement with the YG Center. So without further ado. Okay. I didn't give it all away, but I do. <laughs> so, yeah, like I said, I'm Howard. I'm not used to talking to big groups of people, even though I did drama in university. I'm supposed to prep you for that. I'm getting ahead of myself, though. So, um, I guess, you know, my entrepreneurial journey, I guess it starts with a question, how many of you right now are bored already? Okay, awesome, entrepreneur, <laughs> right there. Let's get going, let's move on. Okay, let's, let's not waste any time. Um, so where did I, how did I end up here as an entrepreneur? How did I end up running my own design consultancy? How did I end up starting companies or becoming a partner in a company? Um, it kind of started when I was in grade five, I guess, way back then, um, doing what, kids do, you know, my, we, we had a boat, my parents, you know, in the 70s, it was like, yeah, we got a boat, and if you have a boat, you gotta have water skis, right, so you got these water skis from the 1960s, if you've ever seen water skis from the 1960s, even in the 70s, they looked old, they were wood, it was about this wide, they were about yay long, it had wooden fin that was screwed into the bottom, these big rubber things, well, that year, we bought a second set of water skis, newer ones, because my dad couldn't water ski on those, so he had to get new water skis, so that the old ones get left in the shed. And never leave anything in the shed if you don't want, you know, grade five power to make a mess of it. So that winter, I went out for a snowfall, I grabbed my dad's saw, I cut this water ski down to about yay big, unscrewed the bindings, and decided I'm gonna go down the snow with this water ski. Didn't work very well, but it was more fun than skiing, right? Because it was like standing on a toboggan, but it was smaller. It was great fun, right? Now, to my parents, it wasn't, it was not a snowboard. <laughs> to my parents, actually, there weren't even snowboards then. It was just, you know, you skied or you didn't ski, cross country, downhill. To my parents, it was you wrecked. <laughs> this water ski that we could have given to the uncle who just bought a boat. Well, to me, it was trial and error. That's what it was about, you know? So I started really young, something I want to try. All right, I'm gonna go out and prototype it. I'm gonna go out and iterate it. I'm gonna just start somewhere and take it to the next step and see where that next step gets me. So that's, is that entrepreneurship? Is it? <laughs> yes, no, yeah, maybe? Yeah. It's more an inventor. Becoming an entrepreneur is also having some business sense, right? You can invent stuff, you can come up with great ideas, but to be an entrepreneur, 
you have to start to look at the business side of it as well. Now that happened in grade six. So the summer between grade five and grade six, I was doing what you know any kids do. We were hanging out in ravines and you know breaking into abandoned cars that were shoved down into the ravine because that's kind of their worst thing. And I found this box in the trunk of a car that was there. And this box had these little bottles, glass bottles, they're about this big, and they had Coca-Cola, and they were little Coca-Cola bottles. And I looked at them, and I said, hey, I've seen these before. They, they paint the inside black, they put a label on it, and they have a little cap that has a loop, and you can, you know, you wear them as a keychain or earrings or what have you. But these ones hadn't been finished. So my brain goes, hey, maybe we can make a few bucks off of these, right, in school in the spring. So I grabbed my friend and said, hey, here's an idea. He's like, oh yeah, let's let's sell these. We can we can sell these for like 25 cents a piece, right? It didn't cost us anything. And I'm like, no, I got a better idea. I'm gonna sell them for 25 cents a piece. And when I run out, you sell them for 50 cents a piece. <laughs> so that is more entrepreneurship than inventing. It's thinking, how am I going to build this market? So that's where I started, but it's not how I got here. That was, you know, fun. Loads of jobs, everywhere and anything that I could learn. I worked in factories. I worked in machine shops. I worked in Le Chateau. That was weird in the 80s. Um, I think Le Chateau is strange now. It was very strange in the 80s. Um, what else? I worked in the record store. I worked at Sam the Record Man. Um, I was fortunate that music was a huge part of my life because my father's company manufactured records and CDs, and, you know, at that time records and cassettes, eight tracks, things like that. So I was always at the place and I worked there and I worked for MCA and RCA, I worked for printing companies that made the record, the albums, you know, the, the, uh, the actual printed, the, the sleeves that we, you know, you put the records into. But it was always about learning the process of getting product from manufactured from raw materials to the consumer. And everything went into that. It, it was just fun. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed I enjoyed the smell of factories. You ever, you ever open a disc? You ever open a CD and smell it? Or a DVD and smell it? That smell? It, it's kind of a weird sort of plasticky smell. Like new car. Yeah, it's like new car, but it's a new DVD smell. That smell reminds me of my dad because that's what facility smelled like. It was the printing ink that, that gets silk screened onto the discs. It's the warm plastic. So whenever I open the thing, I smell it. My wife thinks I'm a lunatic, but it triggers a memory for me, that smell. And it's a very strong memory. I always equate that smell with a time in my life that was great. Remember that, it's gonna, it's gonna be important later when he brings up something about marketing. Um, so let's see, this is how my brain works. I forgot where I was. Um, yeah, learning. So I did loads and loads and loads of jobs and a lot of stupid things. You know, I had a lot of stupid friends when I was young, which was good, right? Because sometimes stupid friends let you do things that teach you something, you know? They do stupid things and get in trouble and you go, I learned from that and didn't have to get in trouble. <laughs> I didn't get arrested. This is awesome. Or they say, oh, you're learning how to tattoo. Woo, free tattoos. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I'm glad you're stupid. I wouldn't want to practice on somebody. <laughs> but you know what? 16 to 18, I practiced tattooing. I bought a tattoo gun, practiced on with some friends. They got free tattoos that weren't so great, but it paid for my first degree. I went to Sudbury and took a degree in graphic arts, and I spent the time that I was up there from 18, 19 years old tattooing, making money to pay for my school. And then I left and I worked in a bar. I worked as a bouncer, I guess you could say. You're not big enough. What? Oh, really? <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Who said I'm not big enough? <laughs> it's not about size. It's about, it's about interaction with people. It's about knowing your customer, right? A, a drunk person, are they belligerent? Are they angry? Why are they in a bad mood? How can you be their buddy, right? It, it's
it's about reading people and reading their emotions. That's what being a good bouncer is about. And also when they're out of control having three guys that are six foot two and you know have to turn sideways to get through doors standing behind you, right? So, I, I, yeah, I wasn't big enough to be one of them, but <laughs> it, it, it was a job that allowed me to interact in an interesting way and it got me free drinks. And I was the guy who everybody wanted you know, to be friends with because they all wanted to get into the concerts. We, I saw loads of great concerts. I was fortunate enough to see the Tragically Hip's first concert in Toronto. Like they had only ever played in Kingston and they played Lee's Palace was their first show and I was working door. You know, so th these were fun experiences but they taught me something as I was going. And as I did that, I realized looking at other friends I had who were in the punk scene, who were in the, the, the industrial scene, the goth scene, they were very much into themselves and into what they were doing, but they, where were they gonna be? And later on, I ran into a lot of them 10 years later after I'd been through, through school. How's it going? Well, you know, same old, same old. You know, you go down to the old bar, they're still at the bar, you know? And same old, same old is okay, but we're going from case of beer to case of beer, from paycheck to paycheck. That's same old, same old. But I looked at where I wanted to be, and then I worked backwards in my head. How do I get there? I didn't know I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I didn't know that I wanted to create companies. I had a vague idea that I wanted to do something. And I guess it came down to my ikigai, which in Japanese is, you know, what's your reason for being? What gets you up in the morning? And mine, you know, was always, how do you put it? I guess, you know, some people say the glass is half full or half empty. I'm always looking at it like I, I ordered a cheeseburger. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what gets me up in the morning is that what I want wasn't even offered, it wasn't on the menu. So how do I get there? How do I produce things that aren't even offered yet? So I ended up at U of T and I did mass media. I did, so that covered English lit, mass media, drama. Uh, I did fine art and I did art history. I knew I needed to learn how to do classical painting. I need to understand the real fundamentals of art. It's one thing to be an illustrator, it's another thing to really understand how the masters did it and why they did it culturally, how it all became modern day illustration. Uh, the same with literature, I took English lit. I need, you need to know how to write. If, if you want to write reports, having a English background in classical literature really helps to get your idea across. It helps when you're talking to people, or presenting your ideas, to not constantly be saying um, or ah, uh, or hmm, or having to think, that you can think on your feet and keep the ball rolling. And then I took drama, because nothing prepares you better for getting in front of a crowd, presenting your ideas, being concise, projecting your voice to the back of the room, looking at everybody, then taking drama. And you walk into a boardroom and you use the same tricks that someone uses on a stage to grab your attention, tell a great story, and engage you. And you better believe everyone in that boardroom is watching you. So that's what I did there. And I didn't graduate. I did like four years. I was a couple courses shy. And I kind of looked at those courses and said, yeah, I don't need a piece of paper. I'm off to industrial design. I got to get on to the next step. I don't want to spend another year or do, you know, do these courses that, you know, I think they were first year courses. Like there was a math class and there was a science class that I had to take, something like that. And let's be honest, me and numbers, we had an argument somewhere when I was in grade school. You know, we went out for recess together. I went around the corner with numbers and numbers were never heard from again. The monitor did not see me beating the crap out of numbers. Okay, I know there's numbers zero through nine. I know they're important. I can arrange them occasionally, but someone else can be an accountant. Somebody else can be, you know, that side of the business. And I'll trust them to do their job. It's 
not my passion. It's not my ikigai. So I wasn't going to do a university class in algebra that would have been me just slicing my wrists for a piece of paper that basically says, hey, you learned how to learn. Now go get a job at a, at a you know, somewhere, well, an art gallery. <laughs> Let's face it, English lit, past media, drama. I'm not getting a job at the Royal Bank, right? Um, probably not at a business or something. I'm probably like a librarian or something like that. But it gave me tools that I needed to move forward and start to round out, you know, and begin to think about who I'm, I am and how I'm getting to where I'm going. So I ended up in industrial design. And for those of you who don't know what industrial design is, it's product design and development for mass production. The, the goal of an industrial designer is to uh, create products that you want to buy, right? Everybody in here, or I would imagine a good percentage of you have iPhones or Apple products or some sort of an electronic device that you bought because you said, oh, I have to have that, that's beautiful. And I need it, it's beautiful. So you create products. A lot of you are wearing glasses. Why did you pick that pair of glasses? An industrial designer designed those glasses. They designed those glasses so that you would emotionally look at them and say, those glasses are gonna make somebody look at me and go, I know something about that person and how they feel and who they are and what they mean. Same way, I just ordered a new pair of glasses. So this is, these are my, this is the old me. The new me is, is on its way. <laughs> so I'm waiting for those new glasses to, to, to show up and I think when, if anybody, hopefully if any of you decide to, this guy's not a lunatic, we're going to make an appointment with him, you'll see the new glasses and you'll go, oh, you're like a totally different person but I get you. Well an industrial designer reached out, researched, did all of that to design these glasses so that it, they would, would have that feeling. Marketers do it with, with their with logos as well. You get people like Nike, right? You have a Nike logo, and there's a huge, huge Nike thing on right now, which I absolutely love with their new thing. They've become a complete name. It's fabulous. They're getting so much traction out of that, um, but it makes you feel a certain way. So I did industrial design, which focused on product, but at the time, I guess this was in. Yeah, it was 96, I started industrial design. There was a thing, you ever, I don't know if any of you remember the old Nokia phones that had a screen about this big that were, you know, one color, you could play snake on them, you know, and you, there was no such thing as text. Um, but there was this thing that started to become the internet and technology, et cetera, et cetera. And there was a thing called user interface. At the time it was human computer interaction or graphical user interfaces. And that's what I really started focusing on, utilizing what I learned about how churches in the 1400s used images to teach the Bible to people who couldn't read. So there's an interesting sort of connection there that all of a sudden, when you start looking at user interfaces, the early internet, phones, etc., physical buttons on a product, Right? The way you hold something, um, the way you interface with, the way you experience it. It's tied back, all the way back, to visual representation. And it, it, nobody had done it better. Right? Getting people to believe in what they wanted you to believe and understand what you want to understand visually than churches in the 1400s, the 1500s, right through. So that sort of education tied into how do I create a graphical interface that allows people to accomplish what I want them to accomplish, which is buy my product? How do I create the layout? What sort of colors do I use? What sort of imagery do I use that makes sense in today's culture? What do, what do I use to, in order to, to do that? So that's what I started focusing on in my industrial design. And I found that there was a tight correlation between virtual and physical interface. Phones still had buttons. 
but there was a screen on them. Your keyboard still had buttons, your mouse, but it was a virtual interface. So I started to look at the correlation between physical and virtual interface, and that started me down a niche of design thinking and thinking about how to apply the, the processes of design and development into your business, into the marketing, into every aspect of your business. How can we design everything about a business? So that was four years, and I did graduate. Because <laughs> that was one I did graduate. Because I knew I would have to get some, practice, some real practice in this. And without graduating, I would not be able to actually say, hey, I'm an industrial designer. I can design children's toys. I can design a child seat or a heart lung transplant unit or you know, consumer electronics. So I ended up in Japan. My first, well, no, wait, no, before that, before that I did a postgraduate in computer technology. I'd always done coding, but I did a year course in database management, doing SQL server stuff, all the back end we did, we did front and back end, and I really focused on the user interface, on tracking people's movements. Every, you know, most of the class were like, all right, let's get this thing working. And I'm like, yeah, okay, working is the front part, but let's start learning about the user. Every button gets coded to register a click. And when somebody clicks the back button, it's because they've made a mistake. Where did they make that mistake? And how do we learn from it, right? So I was tr creating data in the background that was tracking the user while everybody else was just, okay, I gotta learn how to get the SQL statements to work. <laughs> you know, we gotta, don't wanna lose the database. Um, so then I ended up in Japan working for a Japanese company that did lighting and, and for trains and buses and trucks. And I got, I got to design interior lights for Honda cars and we did these flat panel technologies but not LEDs, they were electroluminescent panels. Um, we did fare collection systems, which over here, I haven't been on a bus in a while, but I, I figured with buses here now, you can put coins in, uh, maybe cash, and you can use your card. Uh, 15 years ago in Japan, we had systems that were a single unit that went into a bus. You could use an IC card, you could reload that card with money by putting cash or coins in. The machine can give you change. It could tell you what was on your card, you could pay with cash, you could pay with a token ticket, you could buy token tickets using your IC card or cash. I mean, it, 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 the systems were phenomenal. And it, it, I didn't own a cell phone when I came back for, I think, five or six years because I'd look at what Rogers and Telus was offering at the time and go, yeah, no, I'm not paying for that. Are you kidding me? I brought a phone back with me that it, it was a flip phone that became a camera and the screen flipped around the backside. It was an open up phone. It, it was phenomenal. I had texting on it. I was doing Google searches and, and word translation right in the grocery store. And I came back here and, and I was like, and I was paying nothing for it. I had 100, 100 megabit fiber optic right into my apartment in, what was it, in 2003. And I was paying 40 bucks a month for it. And I was in rural Japan. I know there's a big difference, but even downtown Toronto, I couldn't get 100 megabit fiber optic into my house. It was like five megabits or eight megabits at the time. They wanted 100 bucks for it. So it was, it was painful, but there was nothing better than moving that far away from Canada, moving that far away from home, because it gave me that ability to see home, to really see what home was. From a distance, when you're surrounded by it and, and it becomes normal and you're, you're in it, you don't see it for what it is. And that translates back into a lot of the design work that I do or projects I work on. I start to develop these, these products and these ideas and I get right into it and I get these blinders. And, you know, and even though I try to be like this, I start to get like this and then I have to just let it go and use some of the design thinking thoughts. Like, you know, silly things like, what's the worst idea? What would be the worst thing that I should make for this, 
right? I need to make a heart-lung transplant device, which I did for uh, a, a unit for a medical company out of U of A. And I started to get really focused on, on this. It was very, very linear. And then I said, all right, hang on a sec, because I, I need to step back from this. What would be the absolute worst thing to make a heart-lung machine look like? That's a great one. I like that. Like a coffin. Yeah, they're wheeling a coffin down while they're bringing the lungs to the, the patient for a transplant. Um, yeah, actually, I ended up with the idea of wouldn't it be cool to have a, a little a sphere like this that was on a pole with a unit at the bottom, and the lungs were suspended inside this globe that they could wheel down, and you could see them breathing and the whole deal. You, you know. And then I thought, hey, this is even better. How about if, as they were breathing, the machine actually sounded like Darth Vader? <laughs> okay, you know, that would be cool. And, and then we could have lights underneath that glowed in with the breathing. And just playing with these stupid ideas, funny enough, they ended up implementing the lights inside because it gave a visual cue to the, the doctors of the breathing that they didn't have to look at the heart, they could catch the light out of the corner of their eye and they could understand that the lungs were moving at a certain capacity, right? So they implemented this really weird idea. The breathing part, they didn't really go for it. They thought it would be kind of fun, you know, but they ended up not doing it. The big dome, they didn't do. But what we did do is we did a glass chamber that sat on top of the device. And honestly, the number of times people said, all we need to do is put a plunger in the front and look like a Dalek going down the hallway. Yeah. It, you know, it's crazy, but it, it was a really interesting project. But it, it, you know, goes back to being able to step back from what I'm doing and and disassociate myself with it completely, and thereby get a completely different view of where I am and where I want to go. And when I came back, my wife, my wife had moved out with me. She she left her job and came out to. And um, we were there for about four years. And we decided to move back here because the one thing you do start to learn is no matter how good you get it at a, another language, you're, you're always a foreigner in Japan, which is unfortunate because I'd love to live there longer. But you'll never be Japanese. You'll never be accepted. So you could consult, you could be really famous and what have you, but you're always, you know, somebody else, here, you know? And I knew I couldn't get to where I wanted to go living there. So we decided to come back and we looked at the market, we looked at what was going on at, in 2006, 2005, and said, what can, what can I do to get to the next stage of where I wanna go? And where I wanted to go was to, be, and, and it was a simple sort of line, to become one of the preeminent um, people in putting, an emotional connection to digital life, to technology. How can I be the person that people come to and say, hey, we, we have a piece of technology that we think is gonna be part of people's lives. How do we make an emotional connection with them? And that's where I wanted to go. So we came up with this idea at the time there were gamers creating computers. And I've always built my own computers. But you know, you build a powerful rig and you do your gaming on it. It's all customization. So I thought, hey, I'm an industrial designer, and I make furniture, let's see what I can do. And this idea started to create, how do we create a luxury computer that is more about keeping the case and changing the internals, that the memories, the photos, the videos, the documents you create and put on the computer the computer should be as beautiful as those memories. That it should be a showpiece, not a piece of plastic stuck under your desk. So we started making computers out of hardwood, one-off and limited edition computers. And we we were doing stuff that, you know, $30,000 computers with diamonds in them, things like this that people were asking us for. But it wasn't about building computers and making money. It was about sustaining ourselves. It was about number one on Wired's magazine's Christmas wish list for 2009. We were the 
there were only two computers that made their Christmas wish list of 100 things. We were number one, and Apple was number 98. Everything else were, pro were other types of products. Um, we were on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. We were in Forbes magazine. Uh, we got a third of a page in Playboy magazine. And if you've ever tried to buy advertising in Playboy magazine, a third of a page is $74,000 for one issue. And we got it for nothing. We were in a hundred and something different magazines and probably about 40 different newspapers around the world because my wife did a really good press release. Everything we did, we designed. Every piece of the company we designed for an outcome of making me a person who could take technology and put emotion into it. That was the point of Suisse Computers. And out of that, I ended up here and started building my consultancy and started doing design work for companies. And that's where I sort of am right now, is doing industrial design for companies, helping them to inject emotion and, and into their products, to look at their products as more than just what they are, more than just the sum of their parts. Um, I've done, I did these little flotation units right out of college. I did these flotation devices for sunglasses a foam pad with some strings in it you attach to your glasses. You've probably seen stuff like that. I think Crokey's does them as well and there's a few other companies. So if you drop your glasses in the water, they float. You can find them. Well, that was great, but you, why should you lose your glasses in the first place? Let's make it adjustable so it stays right on the back of your head. That way your glasses stay on snug because I've lost glasses water skiing. And you know, it's great. They float. But they're also 800 feet that way in the middle of a lake and they're this big and how do you find them floating in the lake when they fall off? Well, let's keep them from falling off. So I, I built on their design and made it better. But we promoted them to cruise lines and to um, resorts. They gave away t-shirts. T-shirt cost them a couple bucks and the person wears it one day, get real sweaty in it, they throw out their bag, they never wear it again. You got a pair of prescription glasses, and those of you who have prescription glasses know, 700 bucks for a pair of glasses that you gotta wear, 150 bucks, 200 bucks for a pair of Oakley's sunglasses. Well, you put this thing on your glasses, you're wearing your glasses every single day that you're on holiday, and this company's logo is right at everybody's eye line on the back of your head, so you're advertising for them. So there was a huge sort of look at, at who's the customer. The person buying it, they're not the customer. The, 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 the person going on vacation, they're not our customer. The customer is who's paying for the advertising. It's Sandals Resort, it's Princess Cruise Lines, because you can cut them out the shape of a cruise ship, or in Sandals logo, right? Or in the shape of Mickey Mouse's ears or in the shape of the Olympic rings. I mean, you know, we had some pretty good marketing on these things. But what they cost us to make and what they cost us to ship, we made some good money on it. We, you know, we, we didn't have to work in Japan, but we did because it was good. Because royalties are really great. There's one thing about entrepreneurs is you get into a business and you know, you start a business and you get a piece of that business and then you move on to the next business and you move on to the next business, but you still have your foot in the door at a bunch of other, bunch of these companies and you're still part owner and you, you put the best piece of people in place, you try to, to continue on where you're going, where, where the company was going. You, you know, I'll never create a company that'll go more than $5 million, you know, a year. That's not my key guy. That's not where I want to be. I don't want to be the, the CEO of a, a $50 million company. I don't have a passion for that. What I have a passion for is creating a new product, doing that initial stuff, learning about the market, you know, see, you know, interacting with people, learning about their needs and solving their problems and creating something that does that, getting the company off the ground, doing the logistics, 
doing all the, the marketing, the, the advertising, that end of things, running it to there, and then, all right, it's now making money, I'm out of here. I want to get on to the next thing, let that run. So that sort of is my entrepreneurial journey from five years old selling little bottles with a friend that we found to helping companies now to, to helping them in their entrepreneurial journey as I'm being an entrepreneur myself. Um, and, but I was quick. It was faster than I thought it was going to be with no slides. <laughs> and this I didn't plan for. Just so you know, this is entrepreneur, you know, inventor type stuff, right? I had to double check what I was talking about when I came in the door because honestly it was like, do I prepare for this? Well, you can't. That's what being an entrepreneur is about. It's like you, you, you either know what you're selling or you don't. I'm, I know who I am. I know what I've done. The story may be a little convoluted, but having a slideshow and notes about my life, I'm not sure how that would work. Right? So you wing it. You learn as you go. You make some mistakes. Um, you get the best advice you can from people. You ask questions and sometimes you get weird answers. <laughs> um, sometimes you get no input from people, but you do the best you can and you make it up as you go along. So that's sort of where I am. Questions now. Who's got everything? Yes. Hey, uh, thanks, Art. Yeah. Uh, I just, uh, as a serial entrepreneur, um, I just want to know. You said you, you, you build those initial, uh, I guess, steps, mm -hmm. and then you make sure it takes off, and you on to the next thing. Do you ever come back and revisit? And are there any uh, particular ones that you really favor over other ones that you've done? Wow. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, I always revisit. I'm always second guessing after I hand something off to a client. Um, it's no longer in my hands what they do with it, right? So you, really, you have to let go. Um, but you know, you're constantly thinking, "Oh, I could have done this. I could have done this." You see the, the product on a store shelf, and you go, "You know what? I really should have made that a little bit bigger." Not because it needed to be, but because the the where they're putting it on a shelf, they can't quite get three boxes across, you know. But there's too much room for two boxes, so they're losing footprint. You know things like that. You you always are going to revisit. Totally. Yeah. And I forgot the second part was anything I really loved. Yeah. That I wanted to do or yeah. wish that I could keep going. I just dissolved a company. Um, I created a product called Big Board Hunter, um, which started out because, as Cecile mentioned, I have a friend who owns an abattoir, and I spent a lot of time hanging out with him because I, I don't work as many as I probably could and I need headspace to think so I tend to go over there and just shoot the breeze with that bird while he's cutting meat and <laughs> doing stuff like this but a lot of hunters bring their game in wild game so during hunting season right now you get a lot of bow hunters but you get the guys you know with the rifles later on they're bringing in meat and you talk to them and after four years of talking to these guys about hunting which I don't do right I you know I think Eating an animal's fine, but you know, actually shooting it's bad karma. <laughs> That's I just not getting into. Um, but I talk to these guys, and they tell me about what it's like. You know, oh man, yeah, I got this thing, and they pull out their phone and they show you a picture, and they're zooming in on it, and you're going, oh, okay, where? Oh, yeah, I kind of see what it is. Yeah, it was how far away, right? And they're out there. Oh yeah, it took me three weeks to get this guy, and it's freezing cold. But I finally got, you know, thing. Or I, I had a, I had a moose ticket, and I'll tell you, there's no moose out there. But man, there's elk and deer, like you wouldn't believe. You ever grab any photos? No, no photos. Well, I got this one photo. Oh, four pixels, nice. So I had this idea, a big board hunter. Make a camera that you can mount on top of your scope, so that when an animal that you're not allowed to shoot comes by, you can take a photo in your natural hunting position. So all of a sudden it's an experience. You're out there for the experience of hunting. You're now in a hunting position, looking through your own scope and taking photos of animals you can't shoot because the fish that got away, right? These guys are macho, 
these guys are, I'm gonna show these off, this is great, showing their buddies these photos. But it's got a 50 millimeter lens, so it's the same as your scope. So all of a sudden, an animal that's down there near that car, 100 yards away, takes off three quarters of your screen and it's crystal clear. It's not this wide angle GoPro way off in the distance, don't know what it is, it's right there. And then there's an app because it's a big board, it's a bulletin board. You post photos, but the app puts crosshairs and shows you where you would have hit the target. Ooh, all of a sudden, now you're not only showing the picture you got, but now look how good of a shot I am as well. Kind of like a filter, you mean? Yeah, like it was just an overlay board. of crosshairs scope, to show, okay. yeah, the scope crosshairs to show where they would have hit the target had they been able to. But then it's also a board. So you upload the image and you compete against other hunters based on how good of a shot you are. So now people are scoring you based on how good of a shot you are and you're competing around the world with people. So it starts to hit them emotionally in a lot of different ways. It extends their hunting, the, the reason that they're out there, it lets them show off, it lets them prove how good of a shot they are. It, it, it really ties into what makes them a hunter. And I, I've got this prototypes, I've got, got units, I developed this thing, I did testing, we got this thing dialed in where I had manufacturers, where I could get all the assembly, I could get everything done that I needed. This thing, I've got, I got like a bunch of these sitting at home still. And I looked for funding, I found funding, but it came with a CEO, which I know I need. I'm not, a, I'm, I didn't want to run the company, and I learned that the hard way through some other companies, but I had this idea and the vision, but I need someone to do the business side. So this guy came with funding and dropped the ball. Absolutely just dropped it. We, we had targets, he didn't miss them. We just did a bad job interviewing. We got the wrong guy. We, you know, we got the money in the wrong place and we didn't make any sales. So we ended up dissolving the company. Um, so you say, you know, is there something I'd like to go back and do again? You know. I, I don't think it's had its time yet. I think that there's still something there, um, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, it, it doesn't even need to be changed. It's it's all there. The package is there. It's just we need you know find the right funding with the right people and just launch it again. Mm -hmm. But I that would be something I would revisit. Absolutely. Yeah. I was thinking about being a hunter myself. That would be cool. Yeah. It's it, it's amazing how much money that spend on stuff yeah. and especially stuff on the trip alone you got to map out your oh, yeah, like nine grand for yeah. some of these trips and yeah yeah and if you don't catch anything it sucks well but if, if you learn something from something like that that would be yeah more useful yeah, exactly I saw a hand there yes I'd like a three-part question oh wow okay so let's 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 start with the first and then we'll go the first yeah. part was uh you were talking about how you uh, had your degree in so do you think, uh, do you value a formal education? Do you think it would support an entrepreneur? Yeah, I really do. Yeah, um, you know, you hear about guys who started in their basement and they even had blah, blah, blah. Um, university really teaches you how to learn, you know, and colleges really teach you how to do. And this place, and I said this to my couple friends, this place is really interesting because it kind of bridges that gap that it's, it's right in the middle there. It's not pure, you know, get an MBA and, and you learn how to learn so that when you get out, the company that hires you knows that they can teach you to do the job that they need you to do, whether it's in accounting or it's in finance or it's in trading, right? Whichever, where you wanna go. It, and it's, it's very practical, right? And I wish that there was this type of a place available when I was going through it would have saved me four years because I wouldn't have to go to university and college right I could have done everything in one place uh, second question was what's one piece of advice you would give to your 18 year old self sleep now because <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to get any later <laughs> so uh, it ought um, the work life balance doesn't make this <laughs> no it does um, actually you know what I think the first thing would be get out of debt as fast as you possibly can, would be something, buy Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> actually, no, 
couldn't even do that. It would be more like by Microsoft. Um, I'm older than that. Uh, no, in all seriousness, um, wow, that is, that that's something that I have thought about, and I've never really been able to come to a, a sufficient answer because there's just so much, you know. Um, at 18, it, where I was as a person at 18, uh, I I had a 16-inch mohawk. Um, I, you know, I was living a very different sort of life because that was before I went back to school, really, before I sort of had that. I have photos of me, uh, you know, as full-on punk when I was 18, working at Lee's Palace and, you know, going to GBH concerts and Black Flag and, I mean, I'm just getting my dead Kennedy's tattoos removed. You know, I, I was in a very different place. I can't even begin to, 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 let's say, give you some sort of advice that I would give my 18-year-old self that would make any sense uh, to entrepreneurship. But I think it really comes, it really comes down to, as, as he was saying, you know, work-life balance is deciding if you're going to be an entrepreneur early on, you know, how much is enough? What, what is enough to, you know, um, not so much work-life balance, but call it slave wage or wage slavery, what have you, you know, do you need to work 80 hours a day to earn $300,000 a year just to have stuff you don't have time to enjoy? Or can you do like I'm doing now, which is working about 10 to 20 hours, you know, a week and making enough that I can actually enjoy it, right? Um, you know, I'm not, not playing that slave wage game of buy, 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 get debt, 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 interest, 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 more, 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 just to, you know, do something that you, you, you really enjoy. So I wish I could have told myself that, and I would have not so much changed what I've done, but I think I would have, not pushed as hard because honestly, I don't think I got much further ahead doing 80 hour weeks as I am doing, you know, 30 hour weeks. And the third part was how do we reach out to you? Are you on LinkedIn? Um, I'm, on, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'm going to be available here. Um, if you want an appointment with weeks. Howard, please contact me in the Maji Center and we'll, we'll um, work to get you an appointment. Starts next Thursday with his first entrepreneur in residence tent. But again, if I don't have any appointments booked by Wednesday afternoon, I'm telling Howard, sleep in. You don't have to come to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned how um, that uh, you look at where you want to be and then you work backwards from there. Um, what I have trouble with is like, I want to do so many things and I have so many ideas, but I don't know how to focus on one thing that I want to do. So I was wondering, do you have any advice on like choosing that one thing that you want to focus on and work towards? Well, make a to-do list, absolutely. And make a to-do list and make a to-be list. Um, I think they're both important. How many of you have to-do lists? Okay. Uh, how many of you have to-do lists for your personal life and for your school life? It's less. How many of you have to-do lists for each one of the projects in your personal life and each one of the projects in your in your personal life? Right. <laughs> right. Well, your your life is a project, right? You can design it. Um, you can have a to-do list in it. So absolutely break things down into manageable chunks, manageable little to-do lists, because just the, the action of checking them off feels good. is good, it feels good, and it keeps you keeps you going. As far as being able to see where you're going, has anyone here used mind maps at all? Yeah, there's, they're getting nods from one person. So my, do a search for mind maps, there's free programs out there. It allows you the ability to create a center piece and from that have other pieces that come off like a spider's web, okay? And you can go down deeper and deeper in detail. I think for you, you have this idea of my life, right? Which you can 
then break into my personal life and my, my business life or my school and my future. And future, okay, I have this, these ideas and then each one of those ideas has components. It allows you to zoom in and out at a level of abstraction that makes sense to you at the time that you're looking at it. There, there are times where your brain is just 30,000 feet above everything and you're seeing big ideas. And then there's times where you're really looking at the minutia of it. And just having a visual way to keep track of those ideas will really help you. And I think it'll help you see patterns that will allow you to, to, to group these things and say, oh, all of these together kind of group as this title, and I didn't see it before because I was just too spread out. What was the name of the app? It's, uh, there's mind maps. I, yeah, there's a whole bunch of mind map programs. And you seem to have, um, like from your experience of designing, then how do you handle your challenges and then like things that discourage you on your way out? I don't get discouraged about things because I'm always, it's a learning experience. You don't fail, you just learn how not to do something. Um, my wife is always on me because I don't stress about anything. <laughs> I, it, I don't, I really don't, I just. And do you it, stress about your wife nagging you about not stressing? No, I just, you know what, <laughs> and it's funny because it, it's, people say, oh well, you know, it, there's just a report that just came out, they did a test with like thousands of people about stress. And people who view stress as a positive thing are actually healthier and less stressed than people who view stress as a bad thing. This is now scientifically proved. Do a, search, do a Google search on that because they just had this, this report and I'm paraphrasing it. But it really comes down to if you don't give a shit, <laughs> nothing's going to stress you out. And let's face it, what's the worst that could happen? It, you know, like it, if you, you fail a project, Again, if the client, you do a bad job for a client, try to make it up to them. Um, you know, the worst that could happen is that, I don't know, what is the worst that could happen if, you know? They try to go to their competitor if they have a competitor, or they just don't buy your product. Or they don't buy your product, but it doesn't matter because you're busy finding new clients. Maybe they, maybe you don't get a couple clients because they give you a bad review or something, but you have clients that you didn't screw up with, so you know it balances out. And if you have a good work-life balance, and you know you you uh, you you pick the number of hours you want to work, you you know you find that you get what you need out of your your work. And yeah, you had a question. Uh, I pronounced it wrong. Ikigai. 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 Yeah. What advice would you give for somebody still in the process of finding that for themselves? It's going to change constantly. Um, what drives and what gets you out of bed in the morning, hopefully, will not be static. Um, what drives you and gets you out of the bed right now is not going to be what gets you out of the bed in the morning, you know, five years from now or, or, or more. Um, eventually, it will start to become something that's a bit more all-encompassing, you know, such as mine is, it, mine could be used as a, you know, as a, a vision statement for a company. Uh, it didn't start out at like that, you know, or my Ikigai, what got me out of bed when I was doing iBoys was making a certain number of sales. Um, you know, what got me out of bed when I was doing Suisse Computers was getting into another magazine. Right? Uh, now it's become a little more all-encompassing. So, you know, it will change and hopefully you'll want it to change and you'll, you'll work at making that change. You'll design it to change. Get close, we've got a few more questions. Anybody? I think most people have to get to class, right? Yeah, you guys gotta go to class, all right? Thank you very yeah, much, no Howard, for coming in today. Yeah, yeah. available starting next Thursday, so if you want appointments, please book them with me. And Thanks feel, for coming feel today. Free, feel free to tell her what you want to talk to me about. Yes, so I, I... if you give me, if you, the better